Hello, everyone, and good evening. Welcome to another Tuesday evening with us here at Bnei Baruch. Um, and we're going to take a, we're going to carry on from last week, and we're going to carry on with the same um, passage with the same texts. Uh, and they helped everyone, his friend. Now, yes, last week we had a bit of a problem with the transmission, and then we missed out on a friend's question, which I had in fact answered, but we got disconnected. So let's get to that question first, okay? And then we'll carry on forward, okay? In the meantime, as always, I'd like to just say that the lessons we have here are not for beginners. If you are a beginner, or if you don't know what you fell into, if you're watching these, um, you can always go to kabbalah.info and sign up for a course with the Cab U um, Academy or the uh, or our lectures and courses there, and you can take this course um, with like-minded people over a period of time. So. If you have been watching, though, we're carrying on as usual. So we had a question from Erica last week, and unfortunately, the um, the broadcast got cut off for some reason. We don't know why, but let's see what she asked and how we can um, answer her question. What do you suggest for one with a toxic family member living in the same house that constantly tries to pull one into egoism and away from Kabbalah studies? Uh, from connection, from the ten and the creator. Well, obviously that depends on who it is. Um, sometimes we have um, such cases. Um, obviously, if it's a spouse, um, you know, we'd need to be sensitive about the situation because family is very important. And for all of us, actually, when we're studying the wisdom of Kabbalah, as much as we can, it's really important to be a good example to the family um, so that they can actually see that we're improving and we're becoming better and better. Um, so that's, that's one way. Um, second of all, if you're married and your spouse is really against it, um, maybe it's, it's better if you, you know, first iron out all the creases and you know, work on the situation before you carry on. Because it's really not, you know, we're really not in favor of families being um, broken up um, because of the wisdom of Kabbalah. So um, maybe it's just better to sit down and talk and, and just discover and dig deeper into why they're against it. Um, you can also show them how beneficial it has been for you um, and that how, you know, you've been impacted positively and now you went through a positive change through the wisdom of Kabbalah. Um, if it's a sibling, um, you know, brothers and sisters or mom and dad or something like that, not, not a spouse, but, you know, siblings or parents. Well, if you're, you know, younger than 18, obviously, um, you know, um, they're probably thinking, well, what are you getting yourself into? Um, studying spirituality and that kind of stuff. So they might have some concerns if they're your parents. Um, worthwhile discussing with them as well. Most of the time, um, people disagree because they have uh, assumptions about the wisdom of Kabbalah. They have, uh, and they, they, don't, they don't really know what the wisdom of Kabbalah is, so they sometimes just have this uh, negative view or they looked it up on the internet and they saw that it's something like magic or whatever. Um, you know, Kabbalah is related to many, uh, many things in life. So they may not really know or understand what we're really studying, and they might be genuinely concerned about you, actually. So, um, you know, you might feel it as toxic, but they might just have a genu genuine concern because they care about you and they love you and they want to just make sure you're protected. So, and that's understandable too. So we have to also think and, um, you know, look at the situation from their point of view. The best way to always, you know, is to talk to them, say, look, you know, what's the matter? What's up? Why don't you come and see what they're talking about and, and decide, you know, after you listen to them, or well, that might be one way. But if it's your spouse and if he is really, you know, 
um, hard line on the situation. It might be just worthwhile giving a break and just, you know, quieting the waters down a little bit in the home because the home is really important. Family is very important. So we definitely want to be, you know, uh, keeping the family, um, family peace in the house, you know. So it really depends on, on who it is. If it's your siblings and so on, like I said, they also may be concerned for you because they might, you know, have a misunderstanding about the wisdom of Kabbalah and what it is. And um, it's worthwhile talking to them as well. Um, other than that, the best way to really influence anyone is just to show them how um, you're going through a positive transformation. So if you also display that, um, I think that also helps people. Um, also, if in, in the family, or for example, all of us, um, like we're all married with kids and stuff, you know, we all, we all have families. Um, we also don't really um, bypass any of our responsibilities towards the family because we're studying the wisdom of Kabbalah. So as much as we can, we need to um, make sure that we're taking care of our family um, chores, responsibilities. Um, although we're really into spirituality uh, and we, you know, we're doing the best we can with all our spare moment regarding spirituality, we're also making sure we take care of our responsibilities in the house, uh, towards the family and everything, and spending time with them as well. So these kind of things are important. So I'm not quite sure what the situation is, um, if it's your spouse, your siblings, parents, or whatever. Uh, but generally, there is a misunderstanding, misconception about the wisdom of Kabbalah. And when people really begin to see what it is, understand what it is, and, and the kind of transformation that you're going through or you want to go through, um, normally they don't, you know, they don't really disapprove. So that's about really all I can say. But we're really into keeping peace in the house, in the wisdom of Kabbalah. Our family is very, very important for us. Uh, it's the foundation of, of every Kabbalah student. So um, I would really recommend that if it's your spouse, if it's your husband, um, that, you know, really, you know, just go his way and keep the peace in the house and maybe cut back a little bit or, you know, just um, talk to him about what would make him happy and, and see how that works out. Okay. So that's how it is. <laughs> okay. Um, like I said, from our point of view, family is very important and we do our best to try and keep it together. And I, for one, know it's difficult. Um, um, <laughs> I, yeah. From experience, I can say it's difficult. However, though, um, it's something we really got to work on. So I hope that helps a little bit at least. Um, and um, We can now move forward. So we're going to carry on, carry on with the excerpts from the selected passages regarding the matter of helping each other out. And we left off on item number five. I think you guys have all got a link for this. So, yep. And we can now move forward and start reading from item number five. This is from letter number 13. And next week, we'll move on to another topic. I feel all of you together that today has been replaced for you with tomorrow. And instead of now, you say later. There's no cure for this, but to exert, to understand that mistake and distortion. That one who is saved by the Creator is saved only if he needs salvation today. One who can wait for tomorrow will obtain his salvation after his years, God forbid. This happened to you due to negligence in my request to exert in love of friends. As I have explained to you in every possible way, 
that this cure is enough to recompense for all your faults. I think we read this last week, so we should be on item number six. However, though, it doesn't matter. We'll go over this as well. So what is Baal Islam is trying to tell us here? All of us really need to, if we want to advance, we need to advance in spirituality by caring for others, okay? Because the whole principle of nature is actually this interconnectedness. This also exists in everything as well, between animals even. No animal really wants to go and harm another animal. They just eat each other because they have to survive. And that's the only reason. They, one animal will only harm another just to ensure its survival. That's all. So sometimes they'll protect their hunting zone. Sometimes they'll protect their family and, and, uh, and they obviously have to eat. But no animal will actually go and intentionally, uh, intentionally harm another animal. They just won't do that. It's just against nature. So they won't do it. Um, animals won't make a mistake unless they're sick. So same thing goes for plants and the still level as well. Everything in nature is interconnected. So by definition, this interconnectedness forbids them to harm one another intentionally. They just can't do it. Humans, on the other hand, are a different story because um, we humans, for our self-benefit, we will harm anyone, kill anyone, and do anything to anyone if we feel that it's going to give us pleasure. And because of that, we destroy uh, each other, we destroy ourselves even, uh, and we destroy nature as well. So unfortunately, this is how human nature is, because we are a desire to receive pleasure and egoism, self-love, um, selfishness, rules, that's our nature. Um, so according to this nature, we cannot do any good at all. So inside human nature, there is no good, not a drop of it. So in order to overcome this and change our nature and to build spirituality, which is above our nature, above our egoism, we have to help each other out. And the only way to help each other out is really to help each other to change. Because spirituality is personal change. So what we you know, want to help each other with is showing each other, behaving in such a way towards each other that um, demonstrates care and love. Um, and that's, that's the only way we can move forward. Because if our egoism rules us, if that's our nature, the only way to really overcome it is by the help of the environment, which, which is uh, the group. And through the influence of the environment, um, I can want to do good to other people. And that's how we can move forward. There's no other way of moving forward, by the way. Um, because, ne because the environment, because we're a product of the environment, okay? So this is obvious to everyone. So if we build a good environment and we work and focus uh, on this aspect from this perspective, then obviously um, we can have some positive influence on us where we can come to discerns about what I need to change, how I need to change, what I need to do. So if I delay that, <laughs> If I keep delaying it, then obviously I'm just going to die with nothing in my hand. This goes for everything in life. If I have to do something and I keep delaying it, then it's not going to get done. The Baal Islam rightfully says, listen, there's only one way to get us out of the swamp. And that is to start working on loving others. And to the people outside, you don't study the wisdom of Kabbalah. Sounds like a bit, bit airy fairy. Sounds like it's some kind of a, I don't know, delusion or fantasy. However, though, we talked about this before in the previous lessons, right? We talked about love being laws of nature. So love isn't something like some romantic novel or a poem or a song, which in this world, by the way, is all egoistic. 
Love is a way of taking care of others so that the whole system can maintain balance. And balance means peace and tranquility. That's what the word love really means. So sometimes it's a bit um, tricky using the word love, but Baal HaSalam, as you can see, is not afraid or ashamed at all, saying, listen, you have to work on loving your friends or you're just you know, not going to make it. And we see that humanity is also not really making it um, through everything that we've gone through in our historic history or historical development. We can really see and understand that humanity is just, you know, basically screwed up. Okay. So how can we get out of this situation? Well, the Kabbalists say there's only one way to get out of this situation. Everybody has to start treating each other nicely. And we all have to take care of each other. And we all have to make sure that everybody is well and everybody's treating each other well. Once we have this kind of mutual concern, then we can talk about a better humanity, a better future and a happy life. Other than that, it's not going to happen. So we're either going to do this nicely, I'm going to sit down and study and apply it, like Baal Islam says here, or we're just going to go through Third World War and several billions of us will end up dead and the remaining few will still have to, still have to, take care of this and they have to realize it because life has a purpose. Nothing in life is purposeless. So this purpose, one way or another, will have to be achieved. Either we're going to do it through suffering like we've been doing for thousands of years, killing each other, destroying the planet, bringing upon ourselves untold suffering, or we're going to be smart kids and start learning about it. So basically, that's how it is. So let's take a look at number six. Do we have any questions, by the way? Not yet. Okay. So, at, um, so excerpt number six, we're going to read from Rabash, article number two, concerning love of friends. One must, one must disclose the love of in his heart towards the friends. Since by revealing it, he evokes his friends' hearts towards the friends, so they too would feel that each of them is practicing love of friends. The benefit from that is that in the manner, one gains strength to practice love of friends more forcefully. Since every person's force of love is integrated in each other's. So let's read that once again. One must, one must disclose the love in his heart towards the friends, since by revealing it, he evokes his friends' hearts towards the friend, so they too would feel that each of them is practicing love of friends. So that's really an important application. It should also be pretty obvious, right? I mean, when we're with people that we love, we want to show them we love them, right? You can't just keep your love a secret. So you have to kind of show them you care about them, show them you love them. And what that really does is give the other person empowerment. And this is, we, this is why we try to raise our children with love all the time, because the best way a kid can grow is, is through love. Actually, if you raise your children with love, they become very brave. Um, they become more confident because they understand what love is. So they grow with this confidence if they grow with love. Sometimes people feel like they need to um, raise their children harsh so they can be strong in life, but that's not how it works at all. That's quite the opposite, actually. So if you raise your children harsh, you usually make a coward out of them, and they'll probably end up being a bad person as well in life. Uh, it's worthwhile actually doing a case study on how... Um, you know, how, how criminals were raised by their family. Because the more, they, the more children um, are raised with love, uh, the more their self-confidence, the more their strength and power uh, actually is more founded uh, and they have much better outlook on life. 
Um, so in the group as well, among friends, it's very important for us to make sure that we show love, that we show that we care that we care for other people, uh, because that really gives the other people as well in the group strength. Uh, it gives them a good impression. It gives them the feeling of confidence that we can actually do things together. So even though we're not there yet, we still have to feel like we need to show the friends that we care about the goal, we care about them, and we care about the whole society so that we can actually advance towards what we're trying to achieve and attain. Very important indeed. Okay. Sometimes we feel that um, you know, showing love to other people you know, makes us look weak, uh, but that's actually quite the contrary. Um, showing other people that you care about them, that you love them, is actually one way of showing that you don't really depend on anyone. Um, because a person who cares for other people, who loves other people, is that one that who doesn't need any self-benefit from them. So it's actually a sign of strength and confidence and a really actually fresh outlook towards life. It's a really different perspective of seeing life. Uh, and it actually brings a lot of um, balance to a person as well. It allows a person to, um, to evaluate life from a completely different perspective where you actually don't have any fears because you've got really nothing to fear about. A lot of the times, um, you know, people live in fear in society. They always feel like they need to protect themselves and, and cover themselves and, you know, look out for themselves, check their backs all the time and so forth. Uh, and this is due to the reason that we're you know, living in an egoistic society. So we never really feel like we can trust anyone. So in that kind of a society, everybody's just like, you know, scared and don't know what to do. And this is completely, um, this is why this is, you know, this is why our way of existence right now and our way of treating each other is completely wrong. Um, love and um, consideration, um, mutual responsibility among the friends. They should, that, these should always be displayed with good examples and so on. Even though I don't want to do something, I can still go ahead and do it because I feel responsible for them. Just like sometimes we don't feel like going to work, but we go because we feel like we need to do this. You know, I mean, who's going to pay the rent, the mortgage, the, the bank, the credit cards and so on. So we do a lot of things in life that we don't really want to do. Um, but if we understand uh, that this is better for us, then we're actually um, able to convince ourselves to do things that we don't really feel like doing. And sometimes a person doesn't always you know, feel like he wants to show people he cares, he loves them and so on. But if we get our heads around this, if we understand why this is important, then we can actually convince ourselves quite the same way, like going to work when we don't want to, and really behave in, in that way because we understand it's actually beneficial for us. Okay, there we go. All right, so let's carry on reading. So there are no questions today. Well, last week we got a lot of questions, so this week a bit less. Let's move forward with number seven. In the meantime, let's drink a bit of water. Right. Number seven. In each of them, if each of them does not show the society that he is practicing love of friends, then one lacks the force of the group. This is so because it's very hard to judge one's friend favorably. Each of one, each one, sorry, thinks that he's righteous and that only he engages in love of friends. In that state, one has very little strength to practice love of others. So once again, this is very important for us to understand. If all of us have got a you know, face like we're just eating lemons, and obviously, it's not going to really influence anyone in a nice way, is it? So all of us really have to display and show each other that the friends are important, 
uh, and that we're trying to help each other out and that we care for each other. Otherwise, we're not going to have any juice. The fuel to advance in life, to move forward in life, is actually love. And if you look at your life, we're always seeking love, actually. Even when we're, you know, working to get rich, working to, I don't know, to be famous, like, you know, people, like artists and so on. We're working to be um, a scientist, whatever we're wanting to be in life. We're actually seeking um, this sensation called love that can actually cover and fill the emptiness that we're feeling. If we felt this love in our life, uh, we wouldn't really be searching for anything else. We wouldn't really do anything else because we'd feel quite comfortable in that zone. Uh, and humanity, unfortunately, uh, because there's no love in our world, because of our egoistic nature, humanity has always had to compensate it, um, had to dream about it, had to fantasize it. And this is why we've got so many, you know, songs about it, movies about it, books about it, all talking about love, 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 love. Why would you talk about something so much? Because you don't have it, but you'd like to have it. So this thing called love never really existed. For us, love was always, if my, you know, self-contentment was... Uh, well, if my self-fulfillment was satisfied and saturated, was satisfied, I was okay with it. But that was love. If the relationship gave me a good taste, that we described as love. But once that taste faded or went away, humanity has been going through such situations where we're just, you know, moving forward, moving to somebody else. Uh, and that's actually a sign that we never even had love because love actually um, love actually brings people to resolve all problems, not to turn their backs on each other every time you know, things go sour. Um, love enforces people to bridge their gaps. Um, but everybody, you know, in the 21st century, especially in, in the, since the end of the 20th century, you know, we, we prefer burning the bridges rather than trying to build bridges. So that's how it is. And we all have to understand that human nature does only, the only thing it incorporates is self-love, not love of others. And if we don't build that, it's just going to go through you know, further and further societal destruction, as we'll see as well in the future. Um, close future as well, we can see societies already, um, you know, collapsing, societies already in conflict and so on. So what we have to do is build something that we don't have. So the first thing we have to understand is that we don't have love. We never did have it actually in our corporeal lives either. So what we have to do now is to, is to build it from scratch. And the group, the study group, the environment allows us, facilitates us really, to try to build it. And if we don't build it, we're not going to elevate ourselves spiritually either because spirituality means to actually get out of my skin meaning get out of my egoism and to feel a reality which is much uh, which is which is above the egoistic nature that i'm living in and that requires the attainment of a new perception of reality so this can only be attained if i'm constantly working on this concept of trying to get out of self-concern get out of self-thought because that's the real swamp that really limits myself, limits my life, inhibits me. It's like a cage that I'm stuck in and I can't get out of it. This is why we feel life really tightening around us. It's like, you know, it's like imprisoning us. We can't really feel like we're, we're free from anything. 
Uh, and that sensation is actually because we're stuck in our egoism. So the only way to free ourselves from it is to have some kind of concern for others. And that's where we need to practice it. So if we don't practice it, if we don't show it, everybody's going to think like, well, I'm studying, I'm doing stuff, and nobody else is doing anything. Because our human nature is quick to judge others negatively, never in a positive way. We immediately see faults in other people. So if all of us, though, try to, as much as we can, display concern for each other, love for each other, good relationships between each other, then that will allow us to somehow um, go over the deficiencies of others. So that will allow us to kind of, you know, see the good things in the friends. And that way, when we all begin to see the good thing in others, or the good things in others, hopefully, this will allow us to kind of put the bad stuff aside and not really be concerned with it, but just to be concerned with the good things in the friends. And that's how we can actually get fuel on the way. Because a person can really advance where they feel comfortable. And if we don't make the environment comfortable, um, facilitating and enriching us, allowing us to really move around in the environment and uh, cause some kind of self-development, then we can't, really, we can't really move forward. So everybody who's studying in the group needs to really take care of these um, principles and they really need to apply them so that the application can start to kind of you know, really grind us, bring us together, kind of really mold us, you know, uh, and connect us. All right, so let's move a bit more forward. All right, so finally David's asking a question. That's nice to see. Um, what if you practice love of others, but the others see it negatively? Well, if you're in the group, studying with a group of people, they should also be applying these principles from Rabash. So if you perceive that they're, you know, seeing it negatively, um, you have to still apply it as best you understand. All of us should bring a positive, you know, attitude to the group. Um, all of us should bring a good atmosphere to the group. So if everybody tries to bring a good mood, positive atmosphere, start, you know, um, really displaying that you're trying your best to give the friends a good mood, um, a good attitude, love. Um, it should work, and everybody should be doing it, not just you. The whole group should be working on this. Um, and one should consistently and persistently as well be behaving in this way. Another question, can we truly practice love of others if we are egoists? Well, we can't really truly do it if we're egoists, obviously not. But we can play around it, um, just like kids play around. You know, they're not really grown-ups, but they play as if they're grown-ups. And this playing around this game is very important. Animals grow up with games. We grow up with games because games allow us to practice what it's like seemingly, okay, although it's not real, seemingly it allows us to be in that situation. And this is very important. So we have to play this game. We've got to do it. It's like role playing. Um, Rabash also understands we can't do it. He knows we can't do it. Um, if we're egoists, how can we? We can't. But we work on it. We try. And this trying, this effort to change, actually works on us over time. And it allows us to start tweaking our nature. Because while we're doing this, while we're practicing this, while we're trying to apply this, um, what happens is habit becomes a second nature. So... Um, everything a person does all of a sudden starts to, you know, change the person. So the consistency 
the persistency, the effort, the ongoing effort all the time is really important for all of us. We have to do it, you know, pretty much. Um, this is why we study day to day. We have lessons every day. We study day to day. We've got congresses every now and then. Um, we have gathering of friends. Um, so we get together quite a lot. Um, we get together with the friends twice a day. So we're always in this routine of trying to connect, do our best, move forward, you know, a bit of effort here, a bit of effort there. So we're always trying to add a bit more, a bit more and a bit more. And as we do that, it really begins to influence your heart. Why? Because the more you integrate and interact with the others, you really begin to connect with them. So you kind of feel responsible for them. So all of a sudden, these little changes in a person do occur. And that way, you can also, by trying to do so as well, you begin to reveal and see where you're going wrong as well, where you can't love them, what um, inhibits you to love them, what are the traits in you that do not allow you to care for others. So all these things actually surface. And as they do, it allows us to really pick them off one by one and fix them up. So this constant um, group dynamic that's working on us, it allows us to um, all the time kind of uh, see, see, the, um, um, see what we're lacking really, see the things that really need to change in us. Okay, good. Well, those are some good questions to clarify the matter. Let's move forward with Bala Slums, a little excerpt from letter number 49. I order you to begin to love one another as yourselves with all your might. I mean, look at that. He's actually, this is how he's writing his letter. I order you to. Let's read that again. It's quite impressive, actually, because he's got students he wants to really raise them spiritually like a father. So he really is trying to push them as best he can. I order you to begin to love one another as yourselves with all your might, to ache with your friends' pains and rejoice in your friends' joys as much as possible. I hope that you will keep these words of mine and execute this matter to the fullest. So as you can see, sometimes we think about spirituality as some kind of, you know, um, personal attainment and some kind of sensation uh, of, of, I don't know, whatever sensation a person dreams about or, or fantasizes about. But he's so practical here. He's saying, listen, there's only one thing you guys really have to do, and that's care for each other. If you get that done, that's it. Game over. You've done it. So it's really one sentence that really summarizes what we have to do. Another little excerpt from Kalman Halevi, and he's writing like this. It's appropriate and correct to hold tight to love of friends and draw them closer to the path of the Creator, for by this one can extend illumination for many days by bringing them closer to the work of the Creator. So that's how we should be helping each other, actually. What does love of friends really mean? Well, it, it means helping each other and caring for each other's spiritual advancement. Because at the end of the day, what is a good friend? A good friend is, is in the group, obviously, is one who helps us advance in spirituality. So this is very important. All of us um, are trying to help each other to move forward in spirituality. And that's our main concern. That's how we want to be uh, concerned about everything in the group, that all the friends will actually attain the love of friends so they can get closer to the Creator, because Creator's attribute is love and bestowal. So if a person attains love and bestowal, he begins to exist in reality like the Creator. So the whole perception, the whole existence, the sensation of existence changes completely as a person 
is elevated uh, in the degrees of spirituality. So all of us should hold each other tightly as we advance in spirituality and help each other out. Okay. Let's move to the next excerpt, which is number 10. Rabash is saying, from article number 13, we must always awaken what the heart forgets. What is needed for the correction of the heart, love of friends, whose purpose is to achieve love of others. This is not a pleasant thing for the heart, which is called self-love. Hence, when there's a gathering of friends, we must remember to bring up the question, meaning everyone should ask himself how much we have advanced in love of others and how much we have done to promote us in that matter. So that's actually self-measurement, isn't it? So he's asking, well, we need to advance in love of others, but our heart doesn't really allow us to do so. And that's actually a measuring tool. So everyone can actually measure themselves every day. Have I done something that I could have and I didn't? So these are the lackings, the deficiencies, the, um, the, you know, the empty empty potholes that we need to really fill up. Did I, did I miss out on something? Could I have done something but I didn't do? So these are all self-scrutinies a person needs to go through. And I think um, this can only happen, uh, obviously, for someone who's working in the group. If I'm, if I'm on my own, I can't really self-scrutinize myself. I mean, who am I going to work towards? So a person has to... Um, you know, apply the study in an environment so you can say, oh, wait a minute, I could have done this and I didn't do it. Um, you know, I, I didn't want to do this, I didn't do that, and I couldn't do this. And I, you know, a person has a thousand of one, a thousand and one things that he can see um, about himself when it comes to application. So doing the work in the group allows us to really. Um, you know, sort ourselves out, fix all the problems that are inside us with respect to caring for other people. Obviously, we can't change our own nature. We discussed this before. However, though, a person can want his nature to be changed if he or she sees that their nature is not good. Just like in life, when we're sick, we want to get better. So if a person sees that egoism is really a sickness and it's causing all of us a lot of harm and grief, then we we'll, would want to get rid of it. Egoistically, we'd want to get rid of our egoism. And that's fine. That's actually what we should be coming to. Because we can't obviously change our nature to love, but we can, um, we can want to get rid of egoism. And that's already a huge step. Because now we're trying to you know, get rid of an attribute that's causing us really evil. All right, so let's do one more. Let's jump on to number 12. Here's a nice, short, and sweet one. From Baal Salam's Shamati article number 99. If one does not have any desire or craving for spirituality, if he is among people who have a desire and craving for spirituality, if he likes these people, he too will take their strength to prevail and their desires and aspirations, although by his own quality he does not have these desires and cravings and the power to overcome. But according to the grace and the importance he ascribes to these people, he will receive new powers. So here's also something interesting. Sometimes we might lose the desire or the aspiration for spirituality. And really it happens to all of us. It comes and goes sometimes. And sometimes life is so pressuring that, you know, we can't even think about spirituality, just trying to sort out our lives in corporeality. 
And this is where the environment becomes really handy because it's the only, it's the only, it's the only tool in my toolbox that can actually remind me why I'm living, what's the meaning and the purpose of life. These things quickly slip away from a person if a person uh, is not reminded because our normal nature doesn't want to really seek spirituality, just wants to seek comfort. So trying to um, move into spirituality, go into spirituality, think about spiritual, spirituality is not going to happen. So even if I have those moments, but I don't leave the group, I'm among the guys, then I can actually be influenced by them. And that influence can really help me, can give me power and strength to move forward. So if I'm having a bad day, and I'm you know, completely out of desire, don't want to do it, I'm lacking all the forces, got no inspiration, really down day kind of thing, then I can actually stick my head into the group. Or if I'm already in there, the friends can actually give me a lot of strength because if I connect with those people, then they can get me out of any swamp. They can get me out of any bad mood, anything. They can really give a person, the friends, the environment, can really give a person the desire to get up and run forward again. We can also witness this in our, in our corporeal lives as well. There's nothing new here. This is not a new trick. In our corporeality as well, if we have um, friends and family that support us, help us, then obviously every time we fall down, we can just get up and run. So this is not a wonder. It's not a, uh, you know, it's, it's nothing patent, patented. And this is something we can all apply in life, and especially in spirituality, when you know, we're really not inclined to, to love others. Right, I hope, I hope this evening was um, helpful to all of you guys. Once again, if you're not studying the wisdom of Kabbalah, and if you're just happening to watch us um, by coincidence, although there are no coincidences in life, uh, if you just happen to be here, then what you can actually do is go to kabbalah.info and sign up for a course if you want to do so and study with like-minded people. Now, before we end up, we've got one more question from David. Do we need to have a lack of love in our 10 in order to come to love? Well, a lack of love obviously has to happen, but this will take a bit of time because by our nature, we don't have a lack to love others. You know, we have a lack to feel pleasure from others, which we call love in our world, which is fake love. However, though, um, we can build that um, because if they become important in my eyes through all the work that we're doing, then, you know, then I can... Um, I can say, wow, you know, I really would like to like to um, be there for them all. Or, or I could actually feel sorry that I don't love them or I don't have a lack to love them. That's also a good feeling. Why? Because in reality, everything works from two opposite ends. So this is also um, something that we can, we can think about. So even though I don't love someone, I don't have a lack to love someone, I can actually, um, I can actually think, wow, the reality of the thing is I don't love anyone, I don't have a lack of love for anyone. To come to that understanding is also very, very good. It's very good. Because through that, I can actually start wanting to love. That's a really good question. We need to get to the nitty-gritty of the work here. And as we do, we'll come to many sensations, many um, inner discernments uh, in the wisdom of Kabbalah on the path. It really is, um, the wisdom of Kabbalah really works on a person in such a way that you begin to see all your traits and all your qualities. And it's just, it's, yeah, it's deep. We'll discover a lot about ourselves 
on this path. So in the meantime, you guys have a great day or an evening, depending when you're watching. And hopefully, God willing, I'll see you guys next week. All the best. Have a good day. Have a good night. Bye-bye.